Okay, so this is the second and last session of the day. So we welcome Christoph Kuchian to talk about diagonals of right rational functions. Yes, hello everybody. Um, it's my difficult duty to keep you awake for this last hour of this long day which is particularly difficult as I just arrived yesterday here and for myself it feels like close to midnight, but I will try my best. So what I'm going to tell you is a joint work with um, Youssef Abdelaziz and Jean-Marie Maillard, my colleague in France. Uh, Youssef is our joint PhD student, he's from Egypt, and um, for this um, longer project where we study diagonals of rational functions. We investigate what kind of functions can appear. We have investigated the case where we get hypergeometric functions with pullbacks. We have looked at uh, Hoyne functions. Um, and naturally in this work, uh, sooner or later you encounter Christol's conjecture. And this is mainly what I will be talking about today. So um, probably you also have experienced many talks where you cannot understand five words of the title. This should not be the case here. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, even I give you the definition what is a rational function. Uh, so let, we, let us uh, look at the rational function in several variables. R and uh, so here is the to recall the definition of what is the diagonal of R. So when I talk about the diagonal, I mean the complete diagonal. So we uh, Taylor expand these rational functions in n variables, and then by picking all the coefficients where all the indices are the same, R M M M M, and this now establishes a univariate power series, this is called the diagonal of the rational function R. Uh, here's a very simple example. In two variables, we look at this rational function. We do the Taylor expansion. It starts like this. Uh, if you want to see the diagonal, it is more convenient if we reorder the terms in this quadratic scheme. And then taking the diagonal just means taking the diagonal coefficients. Okay, good. So now everybody knows what a diagonal is. Um, if we study diagonals, we find they have certain properties. So uh, one can show that uh, for every rational function in any number of variables, the diagonal has the property of being globally bounded. So what does that mean? Um, there exist integers, non-zero, such that if I scale my uh, function with the integer c and I multiply it with another integer d, then I get integer coefficients. Or in other words, if I look at the, so in my power series expansion, I have rational numbers. If I look at their denominators, I only find a finite number of different primes appearing in the denominators. So that by this transformation, I can eliminate all of them. And in addition, we have a non-zero radius of convergence. This is what globally bounded means. Um, another property that is very important is that this diagonal is always a definite function meaning that it will satisfy a linear differential equation with polynomial coefficients. Um, or in terms of operators, there exists a linear differential operator in the Weyl algebra that annihilates this function. Um, this can be shown by general closure properties of definite functions. Uh, as we see later, since the diagonal can be expressed as an integral. Okay, now what is Christoll's conjecture? Is basically that the converse is also true. 
So every series in one variable that satisfies these two conditions can be obtained as the diagonal of a rational function. So this conjecture is quite old. It appeared first in a paper in 1986 in a technical report by Chris Toll and still is widely open. Um, also because it doesn't say anything about the number of variables. It says this function is the diagonal of some rational function, but it doesn't, we don't know at all how many variables will we need. So it is for sure clear that we need at least three variables. We cannot succeed to write any such function as a diagonal of a two-variate rational function. Uh, so we need at least three variables, but still up to now, if I'm not wrong, we don't know of any explicit example where we can prove that three variables do not suffice. Okay. So here is the original paper of Christol where he states the conjecture. So the conjecture is at the very bottom and here this is basically the introduction of what I had also on my slide that every diagonal of a rational function satisfies the following properties. So yeah, he uh, <coughs> formulates it in a slightly different language but here you find that uh, it's a solution of a differential equation and so on. And here this stuff is the conditions on the globally boundedness and then it says uh, every series that satisfies these properties is the diagonal of a rational function. Okay, a few other definitions that we will need. For many of you it's uh, certainly just a recall. So uh, the Hadamard product of two series, one series f of x alpha n times xn, g of x, beta n to the, uh, times x to the n. We take the Hadamard product denoted by star is the coefficient wise product of these two series. Um, note, diagonals are closed under the Hadamard product. So if we have two series that are diagonals of rational functions, their Hadamard product again will be the diagonal of a rational function. Uh, another recall is the uh, hypergeometric, generalized hypergeometric series. So using this uh, common notation for the Pochhammer symbol, we define the PFQ hypergeometric series as the series in one variable where we have the product of the Pochhammers in the, uh, in the top indices or in the numerator and the product of the Pochhammers of the bottom indices in the denominator and this additional scaling by k factorial. Um, if you look at these hypertriumatic functions, we find that all of them have the property of being definite. The most prominent example is maybe the classical Gauss hypertriumatic function 2f1 that satisfies this well-known second order differential equation. But also all the other PFQs with whatever number of uh, parameters they also satisfy a differential equation in X of a certain order. So they are all definite. And therefore, they provide a, a natural testing ground for the conjecture. So we uh, can look for, for examples or counterexamples by studying uh, hypergeometric functions. And so you note here that uh, in general we have uh, can have any number of combination of, of parameters in the top and the bottom. Here I restrict to p, p minus 1 for a very simple reason because any other combination will not give us series with the desired properties. So if we have q being less than p minus 1 then so if, if we have fewer parameters here on the bottom then it is we will easily see that the radius of convergence will be uh, radius of convergence will be zero. So these series are not interesting for our purposes. And uh, in the other direction, the, if we have uh, uh, many more parameters here in the bottom, we will fail to be globally bounded. So they are also not interesting. So the only ones that are potentially globally bounded and radius 
non-zero radius of convergence are where we have one parameter b less than the a's, which is compensated by this k factorial. So we have really balanced um, hypergeometric functions. Okay, now a few results that confirm that are in favor of Christol's conjecture. Um, so here's a theorem by Christol. If f of x is a hypergeometric series of the form that I stated, p, p minus 1, um, and has height, so what is height? Height is defined here. It's the, we, take, we look at the number of b parameters that are integers minus the number of a parameters that are integers. Where for here, for calculating, looking at the b parameters, we also include the, the, the invisible bp that is 1. So that always has to be taken into account. Um, uh, yes, uh, one more thing. When I write here in C, actually, I mean in N, because from the definition, you see that if one of these parameters is negative, then if it's one of the A's, the series is terminating. And, okay, not so interesting for our purposes. If one of the B's is, neg is negative, then it's even not defined. <clears throat> okay, so we define the height of a hypergeometric series. And if a series F can be written as the Hadamard product of H globally bounded series of height 1, then this series is the diagonal of a rational function. So here's an example that exemplifies the theorem. We look at this hypergeometric series. It has height 3, so we have, uh, we have 0 A parameters that are integers. We have 3 B parameters that are integers. And it can be written as a Hadamard product of three series of height one. So we get these one F zeros. Uh, yeah, we distribute the parameters here and the ones go into the, the missing B, the last B parameter. Um, and we take the Hadamard product. Then we get this hypergeometric three F two. And it is easy to see that this one F zero is just the algebraic function one minus X to the power minus one third. And so we see that uh, this function is the diagonal of this algebraic function in three variables. So this also exemplifies the statement that why diagonals are closed under Hadamard product, because we just take the different functions, we introduce new variables and we multiply them, and then the diagonal will be exactly the, the, what we get from the Hadamard product. <clears throat> okay, so now we should wonder. Um, I was always talking about diagonals of rational functions. Here, power minus one third is not a rational function. This is an algebraic function. So we need a few more theorems. This is a theorem by Furstenberg that states that any algebraic power series in one variable is the diagonal of a rational function in one more variable, in two variables. Um, and we also, of course, need a multivariate extension of this. This is due to Deneff and Lipschitz. So if we have a power series in n variables that is algebraic, then there exists a rational function in the twice the number of variables, in two n variables, that um, whose diagonal is this algebraic function. While here, if I say diagonal here, is not the complete diagonal, but only the diagonal with respect to pairs of variables. And uh, what we used in the in the previous one is this theorem by Christol that if we have a pf p minus one hypergeometric function of height one, and if this is globally bounded, so so if you have such a hypergeometric function, the notions of being globally bounded and algebraic are equivalent. This will also be useful. Okay, so now let us um, study what happens if we look at two F1 functions. Well, we will see that this case is not very interesting because all three F, all two F1 functions that are globally bounded are already diagonals of rational functions. This gives another confirmation of Christol's conjecture, but uh, doesn't introduce potential counterexamples. 
So if we think a little bit about this, so if we let a and b be rational numbers, not integers, then the case that the bottom parameter c is, a, is an integer, then as we saw before, we can write this uh, hypergeometric series as a Hadamard product of two to a, a one F zero functions, which are algebraic, and therefore it is clearly uh, uh, the diagonal of a rational function. And if C is not an integer, then we see that the height of this function, if all these are rational numbers, then the only integer is the one in the bottom. So we have height one. And by Christoll theorem, then this is also algebraic and also the diagonal of a rational function. So with two F1 functions, the situation is quite clear. So let's move to three F2 functions. Um, okay, so now we have five parameters here. We assume that the top parameters are rational numbers, not integers. And we ask, when can we expect that this function is the diagonal of a rational function? And again, there are several cases. So if both D and E are integers, then again, we can do this trick with the Hadamard product. And we see that it's uh, easily, it can be easily seen that it is a diagonal. If both of them are not integers, then again, we have a function of height one and it is algebraic by Christoll's theorem. So the only interesting case is where in the bottom parameters, we have one integer and one rational number, not an integer. Okay, so we will uh, look at this case now, but even there we find that many of those hypergeometric functions can be easily seen to be diagonals. So, okay, we now assume that one of the bottom parameters is an integer. I put here one, and the other one is uh, a non-integer, as uh, and, and also the bottom, the top parameters. And we assume that this f is globally bounded. So now what can happen? If you now again try to, re to decompose this hypergeometric series as a Hadamard product of two simpler series, then there are in total six ways uh, but only two essentially different ones. The other ones follow by permuting the parameters. So one way is to have the a, b uh, going here and the d going here and then we are left with a 1f0 with the top parameter c. Um, and of course it's uh, here we can have a, c or b, c. So this gives us two more. And the second way we can do is that here we put a one in the bottom. That means we have to somehow introduce another one in the top so that everything works out. So think of introducing a one here and a one here, then we can distribute the parameters in this way, getting the Hadamard product of two, two F1s. And again, there are in total three of such possibilities by permutation. Now, if you look at these, functions. Well, this one is trivially a diagonal and this is a diagonal of what we said before. So we should focus on the remaining ones. So this one appears here. So we should focus on, on, on these guys here. So if, if either this one or this one is a diagonal, then we can conclude that our 3F2 is also a diagonal. And since these are two F1s, that means if one of those is algebraic. Uh, there is a result by Goursat that says that this one cannot be an algebraic function. So we are left with the only possibility that we have to check whether this fellow here is algebraic. And since we have three permutations, so we have these three possibilities. If one of those is algebraic, then our function is the diagonal of a rational function. Otherwise, we cannot say anything. Okay, now we can study potential counterexamples. Examples where we do not easily see whether they are diagonals of rational functions. 
So these are examples where we explicitly avoid that they can be written in the ways that I described as Hadamard products of simpler functions, of algebraic functions. <clears throat> so already in his uh, article, so here now is the reference of this 1986 paper, uh, Fonction Hypergeometrique Borne. Um, he has already one example that is still open. And then in 2012, Bostan, Bukra, Kristol, Hassani and Mayal they came up with a much longer list of functions where we don't know whether they are diagonals of rational functions. <clears throat> okay, and here are two of these potential counterexamples. So there are two innocent looking hypergeometric series of type 3F2. If we scale the variable accordingly, we find that they are actually series with integers, integer coefficients. So obviously they are globally bounded. They are definite. So we should expect, according to Kristol's conjecture, that they are diagonals of rational functions. But so far, nobody knows. Um, so, and just to demonstrate that for them, it is not possible to write them in the simple way as Hadamard products of algebraic functions we have to look for the, for the first function at these three 2f1s and for this example at these three 2f1s and we find that all of them are not globally bounded. Okay, let's do a little exercise to convince ourselves that this is the case. Uh, so I pick the first one. If I expand it, well, the, Poch, um, uh, the Pochhammer symbols, they give us these uh, factors here. So we see that uh, we can pull out all the threes in the denominator and we are left here with a arithmetic progression 2, 11, 20 and so on. So this goes in steps of 9 and here the bottom parameters go in steps of 3 uh, up to here and this is from the k factorial. Um, so if we assume that this guy here is a prime, then we ask ourselves can this cancel or not? Well. In order to cancel, uh, it should be 2 mod 9 or 5 mod 9. Then it will appear in the top. Otherwise, it will survive in the denominator. So we find that in the series expansion, all prime numbers that are 8 modulo 9 will appear at some point, And therefore, clearly, this series is not globally bounded. And now you also see that when we look at the according at the corresponding 3f2, where we have here the, the, the other parameter 8 over 9, that everything works out and, and all these factors will cancel away so that we have no, uh, no infinite sequence of prime numbers appearing in the denominators. <clears throat> okay, now what we found out, what we showed is that these two guys, they are actually diagonals of rational functions. Uh, and we can even explicitly write down. So this guy is the diagonal of this algebraic function and a very similar algebraic function appears for the other 3F, uh, 3F2 hypergeometric series. <clears throat> And we can generalize this to have here an arbitrary rational exponent. And we show that this will give us a 3F2 with these parameters. Okay, so since we should have a proof, let's go through it quickly. It's, uh, it's not complicated, it's just calculation. So if we want to, we compute the diagonal of this function, we do the general case. So we look at the denominator, we expand it as a geometric series. We look at the numerator, we expand it using the binomial theorem. And then we should multiply these two things together. So this is a bit painful, but we uh, just write it down. We uh, look at the powers of x, y, and z. We combine terms, we have to re-index and introduce new summation variables. And then what is written here, so this part will be the coefficient of the diagonal if we impose s equal t equal u. 
Okay, so let's do that. We set all of these powers to n. Then we are left with this double sum that gives us the coefficients of the diagonal. And so looking at this, if we want to do it by hand, we find that we can apply the well-known true van der Monde identity that I recall here to, uh, we have this here, we have this here. So this will simplify to the single sum. And then probably there's another general identity that will, which will uh, apply to this one, but I was too lazy to look it up. So I was stepping back to use my favorite computer algebra tools to treat this single sum uh, and to simplify it further. So more precisely, what did we do here? We apply Zeilberger's algorithm since this is a hypergeometric sum. We can apply the classical Zeilberger's algorithm to it. And this will give us a recurrence for this object. So if we call this sum to be S of n, Zeilberger's, <coughs> Zeilberger's algorithm finds a recurrence of order one for this sum. And now if you look at the coefficients, you already recognize the uh, entries of the 3F2. <coughs> because when we solve this recurrence, these factors will uh, exactly uh, multiply up to the necessary Pochhammer symbols. So the closed form is this one, and this is exactly the form we need for the hypergeometric series representation. Okay, so this is the proof by hand. Of course, we prefer having a more automatic proof. And for this one, I have to quickly talk about how we interpret diagonals as integrals. So I do it for three variables, but of course it can be formulated in any number of variables. So we have a function r in, in x, y, and z, and we want to take the diagonal. So we can express this as doing this transformation on r, replacing x by x over y, y by y over z, and keeping z uh, uh, the same and then extracting the constant coefficient with respect to y and z. Uh, why is this the case? So if we assume that r has this power series expansion, if we do this transformation, then we will get this. And clearly, if we, if we extract the constant coefficient, so we want to make this zero and this zero, we get l equals m equals n. So now looking back here, this constant coefficient extraction, we can write it as a residue for, uh, with respect to y and z. So we should divide by y and z to extract the coefficient of the minus one power. And this residue we can equivalently write as an integral over this rational function. And so this interpretation allows us to uh, apply creative telescoping to this function in order to extract to compute a differential equation for the diagonal. So this is what I'm showing here. So creative telescoping can, for such an integral, compute a differential equation that annihilates this integral, that this integral is the solution of. Uh, in this case, if we take this double integral, we obtain a telescoper, so and a, a linear differential operator that annihilates this integral, it's, this is, in this context is called the telescoper, of order three. So you see here we have the third derivative, second derivative, and so on. Um, and it turns out that this differential operator also annihilates this 3F2 hypergeometric function. And by comp comparing a sufficient number of initial values, we can conclude that this 3F2 function is indeed the diagonal of our rational function and equals this integral. Uh, so this is how the computation looks like. Let me do a quick commercial for my software package that is called Holonomic Functions. Um, uh, it's freely available on the RISC website. You only have to send a request to Peter Paule, then you will get uh, access to this. 
So in our case, we enter this algebraic function and to keep the output small, I do the special case for one third, not a over b. So we, in, uh, we enter the algebraic function, we do the transformation, x goes to x over y, y goes to y over z, and so on. And we get this uh, algebraic function that we want to integrate. And now we call creative telescoping. We indicate that we would like to integrate with respect to y and that the surviving variables will be x and z. So what we get, this output, and it's a bit longer, but well, if the screen would extend until here, it would fit, so it's not terribly big. Um, what we get is a set of generators for the telescoping ideal in two variables. So as you see here, we have the differential with respect to z and here and here again, and the one with respect to x. So this, what we see here, is a, is a Grebner basis of that telescoping ideal. So that is the ideal that annihilates the, the function after the integration with respect to y. So that means we have to do another integration step that is done here, now with respect to z, and what is left is a univariate differential operator in x only. And to compare, we compute the annihilator of the hypergeometric 3f2 function and we get exactly the same differential equation. Okay, so now since we have expressed our function as the diagonal of an algebraic function, let us also construct the corresponding uh, rational function. So um, as I told you, Denev and Lipschitz, they have the theorem that any algebraic power series in n variables can be written uh, as the diagonal of a rational function in two n variables and this result is not purely theoretic but it is constructive. So we want to find now this rational function in two n variables such that its diagonal is equal to the diagonal of the original algebraic function. Or moreover, if we take the partial diagonal identifying the variables x1, xn plus 1 and so on pairwise we get a, a series in n variables, and this is exactly our algebraic power series f. So for, to, to exemplify this, we use our, this this what first, algebraic function, but of course we can in principle do it for the general case where we have a over b here. So the expansion shows that this is a nice power series. And uh, we should look first at the minimal polynomial of this function. So since this function is so simple, the minimal polynomial, we just multiply the denominator here, we raise it to the third power, so we get this as the minimal polynomial of our algebraic function. And then there's just a, a small technicality that the theorem is formulated for so-called etal extensions, that means that the partial derivative of the minimal polynomial with respect to the function f has a non-zero constant coefficient, which, if you look at this here, is certainly not the case. If you take the deriv derivative with respect to f, we do not get any constant coefficient. So, but this is easily repaired by considering f tilde to be f minus 1, so we remove the constant term of f, and then the minimal polynomial is this, so then here we have this plus 1, so if we expand this, you see that after taking the derivative there will be some constant coefficient, minus 3, so then we are fine. And so what they show now is if we define this rational function here, r tilde, is a rational function in four variables, in one variable more than we started with, so we have f square, then we take here this partial derivative with respect to f, and we insert the f everywhere, and we divide it by the minimal polynomial itself, that this rational function has the property that after a special kind of diag diagonalization, we get our original f back. So what is this special diagonalization, this d? If we apply it to r tilde, we get our f tilde, so it denotes this kind of diagonalization. So we have a power series in n plus 1 variables, and it gives us a power series in n variables, where 
we extract the coefficient for which the, the j exponent is equal to the sum of all the other exponents. Okay, so this is the first step. This is not the diagonal that we want, but um, it will come on the next slide. So this thing with the minus 1, we can reintroduce it here so that uh, if we add this 1, then we get really that this diagonal gives us our algebraic function. And in our example, it looks like this. Okay, so it's still relatively peaceful. Now, in order to come to a rational function whose true diagonal is our algebraic function, we have to do another um, sequence of steps. So in, in each step, we introduce one more variable. So we start with our rational function r in four variables, and then here we introduce two new variables, but we skip the f. So we have here u1 and v1. We divide by their difference, and what we get is a rational function five variables. And then you do this as often as it is necessary, in our case just a second time, to get this rational function in six variables. And we can then check that indeed this r2 is the rational function that we are looking for. So in, in general, it looks like this. So we had with the a and the b, we have this hypergeometric function. And then the rational function that we get is a bit more unhandy. Um, so a and b are integers. So this is really a rational function also. It doesn't look like this because of the power a. Um, so for any a and b, we get uh, this rational function in six variables whose diagonal uh, will give us this 3 of 2 hypergeometric function. Okay, so what about, uh, does this solve all of these potential counterexamples in the list? This is the example that Chris Toll came up with. So in the, the only difference is that we looked at the case where this parameter was 7 over 9 and now here this is a 5 over 9. Uh, well, it seems that this is still a hard nut that is not accessible to this approach that we took here. And it can be seen from the fact that if you, if you look at the examples that I showed you, these parameters, these top parameters, they always form an arithmetic progression. So even if you take generalizations of that what I showed you, it will always be an arithmetic progression. And so it seems that this one really falls into a different category of difficulty. So at the moment, we cannot say anything about this one. Uh, one attempt of, of looking at, at uh, these hypergeometric functions in a, in a more general way was to start from the integral representation. So there is this uh, integral representation of the 3 of 2 as a double integral. And here we have some factors with gamma functions. So we can try to start with this one and find suitable, again, suitable algebraic functions whose diagonal will give us this 3 of 2 function. So for example, if we uh, do some transformation and we define this algebraic function that you can really see comes from here. Um, and we do, we do what we did before. We do the transformation in order to extract the diagonal of this function. We compute the telescoper and we get precisely the differential equation for this 3 of 2 function. So that looks very promising because this is exactly what we want. Um, so now we could try to apply this to our example here. So we plug in the parameters to what they should be. We get this algebraic function. Still the telescoper will be what it should be. But of course, if you look at this function, you take the diagonal, the diagonal is just zero because of this y to the four over nine. So on the diagonal, there are no coefficients. The diagonal is identically zero. Um, 
So how how come this confusion with the with the telescope? Well, that is explained as follows. If we compute the telescope of a rational function or any function, then it will give us a differential operator that annihilates the integral, whatever integration cycle we take. So for we, we, when we compute the telescope, the integration cycle doesn't play any role. It's independent of this. So we get a telescope that annihilates all the functions we could get by taking any integration cycle. And therefore it is not a contradiction that here we get something else because still the diagonal is a solution of our differential operator, just a trivial one. Okay, and uh, with this I leave you with some homework. So, if you got interested in this topic, please have a look at this hypergeometric series and try whether you can find a way to express it as the diagonal of a rational function in your choice of number of parameters. And what is, of course, even more difficult will be to prove Christoll's conjecture in general. And I think with this, I end my talk and I thank you for your attention. If we start with a function which is the diagonal of a rational function, then uh, it's broadly bounded and it's confined. Um, I assume that the, that the differential equation is somehow generated from the process. Can is, be. Yeah. Is it the case that uh, if we that if we start with a function which is a diagonal of a rational function, then uh, it satisfies the appropriate differential equation, all of whose solutions are globally bounded? Um, I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I, whether this applies to all the solutions of this differential equation. I don't dare to say yes. Um, so it's conceivable to me that even if uh, Christoph's conjecture is false, that it might be true in that stronger situation if it were true. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, at some point, I think you said that uh, maybe the conjecture would be that you can always write it as the diagonal of a function over three variables. Well, of course, that would be a much stronger statement. Um, the fact is just that so far we have not seen a single example where we probably need more than three variables. I don't know if anybody seriously conjectures that always three variables suffice. I out. So that means all those examples where you have it as a diagonal of, a, of an algebraic function and you do this transformation that doubles the number of variables, then still on every example you can always uh, come up with another one that has three variables. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. No. So for these examples that I showed, we have shown it is a diagonal of a rational function and this rational function is, has six variables. But of course it doesn't exclude the possibility that there is another rational function with the same diagonal with fewer variables. So we don't claim that these results are minimal in this sense uh, of number of variables. Um, I was just wondering if this had an afterlift from the same thing like the Mach theory or is there some kind of implication outside to the bounds Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't okay. know of any geometric interpretation. Yeah. So, is there any kind of uh, interpretation you can make of what it means for two rational functions to have the same diagonal? Yeah, that's another interesting question. 
I have no idea. Characterize all the rational functions that give the there's same no, diagonal. There's no other obvious geometric thing you can do or other things you can do to construct one, one rational function and another one that has the same diagonal? Um, no, not that I know of. So if these diagonals will come up as residue. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the speaker and all the students.